which is the second month of the Coptic year. And the month of Baba focuses on the power of our Savior. And he has the power to lead us to salvation and through our repentance. And today we see a focus on the power over sin. He says to the man uh, in verse 10 that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. This is the key verse for today. In the midst of the scene, we are, we are a witness to an amazing story of friendship and, and the love of God. Uh, four men have come carrying uh, their friend who is paralyzed to see Christ. We don't know exactly how far um, they traveled, but we can be sure that it has been a struggle. It's been a struggle to carry their friend the whole way. These men show a lot of love for their friend, but their love would be tested even further. When they arrived at the scene in Capernaum, they found that there was just so many people and there was no way to bring their poor and sick friend to see our Lord Jesus Christ. At least there was no conventional way to do it. Now, one of the beautiful things that we learn from the lives of the saints is that there's no cookie cutter way, there's no right way to live the life of a saint or to become a saint. Each one of the saints is unique. And while they all have certain aspects of their struggle in common, each one must find their own sometimes unconventional ways to get to the Lord Christ. These four men did that. They decided that there was no way to go through the doors or through the windows of the house, so they would have to look up. They decided that the best course of action <clears throat> would be to drop in from the ceiling by uncovering a part of the roof of the house. Of course, at this time, we're talking about a very different type of construction. But the fathers of the church reflect on the roof, and they reflect on these things. They say the roof is high above all things. This is a lot like Scripture uses this analogy as it uses the analogy of mountains, for example. Sometimes that to say this is how we should be in our Christian life. We should look up. We shouldn't focus on the earthly. We should look up. We should be thinking of the spiritual things. We should be thinking of uh, things away from, from the carnal things, the worldly things. We should elevate our minds. We should contemplate on pure things. We should think of things that God wishes us to know. And so these people, they got up on the roof. So of course, it was a practical act to get on the roof so that they could break through the roof tiles or however it was constructed and to let their friend down. It was actually really ingenious if you really think about it. Okay, so the men did that. They, they hoisted their friend up on high in order to uncover a spot on the roof and to let him down to meet Christ. Now, and this is an important part, the man who was paralyzed never said a word to Christ. It was the Lord who looked on the faith of his friends and said to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. And as I was reading this passage earlier and preparing, I was struck by something really interesting. I was amazed by the way that our Lord Christ dealt with the paralytic that was brought before him. And what amazed me was that there was no hesitation from the Lord. It's kind of what we were talking about yesterday in the youth meeting, that his... His mercy is instantaneous. He gave the paralytic exactly what he needed immediately upon seeing him. Immediately. In verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But the way that the Lord does this defies all human logic and reasoning. 
If any one of us looked at the man on the stretcher and was asked to diagnose his biggest problem, I think there's no doubt that we would all come up with the same conclusion. He can't walk. He's paralyzed. It's obvious. And that would be the correct way according to our eyes and his plain physical condition. However, our Lord Jesus Christ sees much deeper. He is the true physician who sees into the depths of our being. In his opinion, this was not the most important issue that required him. There was something much more important, much more than being paralyzed. This was not the priority. Oftentimes, I think we approach God with a list of preconceived notions about what we need. We want God to fix this glaring problem in our lives. Maybe it's the kids. Maybe it's difficult parents. Maybe it's an inattentive spouse. Maybe it's impossible co-workers, supervisors. We, we also have these preconceived lists of our own issues that we want God to help fix for me. Typically, the list begins with physical ailments, physical needs. Sometimes these needs include financial needs, emotional needs. Oftentimes, we're in apathy or anxious or impatient or angry or depressed. Sometimes we're in despair. We even come to the church with the expectation that the Lord will fix all of these things at the top of my list. And the four men who also carried their friend and came to Christ also had preconceived notions about what was needed. And they knew how Christ could help their friend. Perhaps they heard of or maybe they have seen other miracles that Christ performed. But little did they know that the Lord had much more planned for this paralytic man than simply walking. That's the thing. The Lord has so much more planned for each one of us than simply healing our physical needs. He looks at each one of us and he sees our deepest need. He sees our lives and everything that we've done, both good, both bad. The things that we are proud of, the things that we have healthy shame. And he looks at each one of us and he sees our deepest need. Even the need to have our sins forgiven. To hear the words, son or daughter, your sins are forgiven. Our God is the God of mercy, who does not want us to be buried alive with the burden of our sin. He does not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he should return to him and to live abundantly. The Lord Jesus Christ sees our fallen nature and the way that sin has paralyzed each one of us, he has compassion on us. He loves us more than we can imagine. And he says, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. This is maybe one of my favorite verses in the whole gospel. It's a word of joy. It's a word of promise. It's given not only to the man who is paralyzed, but to each and every one of us who is brought to Christ through our baptism. In the beginning, perhaps we were brought by others. Maybe someone preached the word of God to us, or we were literally carried by our parents or our godparents and brought to Christ at our baptism. But this process does not end at our baptism. We are all called to continue to make our way to Christ by all possible means, all throughout our lives, not just in our youth. As Orthodox Christians, <clears throat> it's not nearly just a nice sentiment. 
It becomes our reality through the life of the church and her sacraments. So the question may come, how do we continue to move towards Christ and to abide in his presence? Here are some thoughts. The first and foremost is to study the Gospels and to obey his teachings. This is the first step. Many of the saints tell us that we cannot know God unless we first try to live according to his teachings. So how do we hear this word of the Lord saying, Son, your sins are forgiven on a regular basis? We hear those words when we come to confession and the priest prays the prayer of absolution. Asking the Lord himself to forgive all the sins that were confessed. And this is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. We find in the Gospel of St. John, after the resurrection of the Lord, he breathes on his disciples and says to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. But whose sins you retain, they are retained. So what's another way that we can receive spiritual and oftentimes healing, uh, physical healings on a regular basis from the church? And this is through partaking frequently of the, of the holy, life-giving body and his precious blood and communion. This is one of the foundational teachings of the church. We have to hear the words of St. Cyril of Alexandria, who writes, this is kind of a lengthy quote, but I'll take my time with it. If the poison of pride is swelling up in you, turn to the Eucharist and that bread, which is your God humbling and disguising himself, and he will teach you humility. If the feverish, if the fever of selfish greed rages in you, feed on this bread, and you will learn generosity. If the cold wind of desire withers in you, hasten to the bread of angels, and charity will come to blossom in your heart. If you feel the lack of self-control, nourish yourself with the flesh and blood of Christ, who practiced heroic self-control during his earthly life. If you are lazy and sluggish about spiritual things, strengthen yourself with this heavenly food, and you shall grow fervent. Lastly, if you feel scorched by the fever and purity, the fever of impurity, go to the banquet of the angels, and the spotless flesh of Christ will make you pure and chaste. All I, I everything in Saint Cyril's mind is pointing to the Eucharist, pointing to the Eucharist for any ailment, anything that's wrong, go to the Eucharist. So we learn that we must not abstain from the bread and wine which are transformed into the mystical body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Orthodox Christians, as they receive the body and blood of Christ as often as possible, with no fear of disease or sickness or anything else, we're, we're reminded that they're not just symbols, as some denominations might suppose. If they were just symbols... They would have no power to help and to aid us in our spiritual struggle. Yet, consistently, we see in the earliest writings of the Church Fathers proclaiming the truth and the power of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. To receive Holy Communion is to receive life. To neglect Holy Communion for a long period of time is to separate oneself from Christ and to spiritually become married to death. Other contemplations about the readings of today. And who are the four friends in today's gospel reading? They are those who push us, those who motivate us to come to the church and to take our relationship with our Lord seriously. Those who preach the gospel to us and to encourage us. Those who pray for us, and to bring our names to Christ when perhaps we don't have the power or the motivation to pray for our own. We can understand the friend who carried the man, the paralytic man, symbolic of the clergy, the bishops, the priests, the deacons of the church who administer the sacraments, who literally bring the people to Christ and Christ of the people. So to conclude today, 
it reminds us, the gospel today reminds us that our faith is powerfully beneficial to others. Don't minimize that in your minds. When we are worried about a friend or a coworker or a family member who has been a little bit distant from the faith or Christ, don't, don't minimize the fact that our faith is powerfully beneficial to others. This is exactly what we do when we baptize infants. We take the faith of their parents and godparents and we ask Christ to see their faith and to count it towards the one who was brought to him. If the Lord Christ acted this way for this man, can there be any doubt that the Lord will accept our faith as well? And as we begin the second month of the Coptic year, we are reminded that physical strength and physical healing means very little if we are spiritually paralyzed. And we would all be spiritually paralyzed if not for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ towards each one of us. And so we pray that we can partake of these great blessings that are offered to us and run to Christ for complete and profound healing of both our bodies and our souls. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are the